So uh, today, uh, uh, in this another session, yet another session of uh, documented dialogues uh, here at Collective for Women Philosophers in India, we have with us Professor Shifali Moitra. Professor Shifali Moitra is an eminent woman philosopher based in India. She taught philosophy at Lucknow University for a few years initially and later at Jadavpur University, Kolkata. It is important to underline that apart from being a professor of philosophy, she held the position of director, School of Women Studies, Jadavpur University, and was also the joint coordinator, Center for Counseling Services and Studies in Self-Development at Jadavpur University. She has held many fellowships across the world, especially the Fulbright Senior Lecturership Grantee to United States of America, the fourth Charles Valley Fellowship for Teaching and Research at Liverpool University and the Indo-French Cultural Exchange Program. Her expertise remains in the domain of feminist philosophy, philosophy of language, ethics, and to a good extent, philosophy of literature. She has published vociferously, and it is difficult to give a proper count. Since the year 2000 only, there are 66 articles and chapters which have been published by OUP, Cambridge University Press, Rotledge, and the likes of Sage. She has also edited five volumes and authored four big books during this time period. Interesting is the fact that her publications portray a rare balance between the vernacular and the global. If I'm to mention a few books, so in Bengali language, uh, she has Rabindra Nitya Natya Ekti Naribadi Path. In English, it translates to Rabindranath's dance drama, a feminist reading. She also has in Bengali only Ujani Mai Simandi Bur Jeevan O Darshan. Translated in English as Simandi Bur's Life and Philosophy, she also has a jointly edited volume, Wittgenstein, Jagat, Bashao, Chintan, Wittgenstein, World, Language and Reality. I apologize for, for, for this uh, wrong pronunciation of Bengali. In English, she has feminist thought, androcentrism, communi communication and objectivity, and also has a jointly edited volume, Communication, Identity and Self-Expression, Essays in Memory of S.N. Ganguly. So this is just a brief uh, uh, number of books uh, that I wanted to talk about here in the introduction. So welcome, Professor Shefali Moitra, and it is great to have you here for our documented dialogue series with women philosophers. We at the Collective for Women Philosophers in India intend to recognize and address the gender gap within the Indian Philosophical Academia. Today's conversation with you is a step in that direction, and I hope we, as well as the viewers, will be enlightened through this brief virtual conversation. So I welcome you here, Professor Shifali Moitla. Thank you, Mulafar. Thank you so much for having me here. So uh, let's let's begin straight away. Can, can you can you kindly uh, 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 I'll begin by asking you about your journey uh, as a woman's uh, professor of philosophy and also as a, 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 a woman philosopher. Like, how has your journey been? Can you can you just briefly tell us about your journey? By journey, do you mean a sort of a biographical uh, account? Yeah, anything, anything like well, anything you want to tell us. It will be very difficult to tell us about your journey altogether. So whatever you want no, to. Any, anyway, I, I can begin by saying that I went to a very, very, very ordinary school. And uh, the medium of instruction was Bangla. So that's where my uh, mooring or confidence uh, with that language began. And then from there, I came to Kolkata, which was a big, uh, big leap for a person coming from uh, a very, very small, dinky little town. Uh, I and went straight to hostel life, and I've been in the hostel, women's hostels, okay. for about 15 to 16 years. So I know the feminine, Victorian, walled up <laughs> kind of life firsthand. Uh, but that particular college was renowned for its uh, philosophy department, a principal who was also our teacher and an eminent uh, 
quote unquote woman philosopher, Dr. Rama Chaudhary, who later became the vice chancellor of Rabindra Bharati, uh, used to take our pre-university classes, some of our pre-university classes in uh, philosophy and <clears throat> logic. And uh, when I uh, went to uh, get admitted in my BA honors, uh, honors was uh, mandatory for going further on to an MA degree. So I had to get an honors um, degree somehow or the other. I had selected uh, going to economics and um, my father had been there with me, <laughs> going to help me uh, do the forms and things like that. And uh, Romadi, who was the principal, uh, saw us standing there, called us into her office and then said that she's coming to philosophy, isn't she? And I was uh, sort of <laughs> dumbfounded. I didn't want to go to philosophy. I didn't like it at all. And uh, so I said, no, no, economics. And But my father said, no, when the principal is asking you, and then Ramadi interjected and said that uh, she's our student, so she has to come to philosophy. philosophy. So that's how I began with philosophy, not by choice, okay. uh, but by accident, and remained stuck there uh, three years for the honors course. And then I needed to get an MA degree, needed to get an MA degree in this sense that my uh, mother was very emphatic about the fact that I must be, have some kind of qualification that leads to a job that if I'm ever, she said that it's quite possible that you won't have to earn for your living, you will be uh, married, settled and, you know, uh, go, be domesticated. But in case it is needed, you must, all of you, all our, our sisters uh, must have uh, some kind of qualification that leads to a job. So I had to do my MA. And uh, Calcutta University at that time did not have any women's girls hostel. Okay. So that's what brought me to Shanti Niketan. They had a hostel. I didn't know anything about the place. I didn't know that it was a center for advanced studies at that time. Okay. There were only three centers uh, in Madras, uh, in BSU, and at Vishavarti. Okay. Uh, so that brought me there. And I continued with my MA and my PhD. Uh, from uh, Vishwa Bharati, enjoying every moment. It was a, a sort of a, a lot of oxygen and open air after those walled uh, years in uh, Brebon, Lady Brebon College. Okay. And uh, while I was there, very fortunately for me, uh, through an inland letter written to a colleague who was also doing his research at that time, I got the news of uh, leave vacancy at Lucknow University and I landed up at Lucknow University. It, okay. I did not apply. It was just through an inland letter that is it possible to find somebody for a short period of time and that's how I got there. So that's what took me to Lucknow, which is a very uh, unusual step yeah. from Vishwavarthi straight yeah. to Lucknow, though my parents had uh, shifted by that time to Dehradun. So I uh, remained in Lucknow for six very troubled years. That was before the emergency, during the emergency, and immediately after the emergency. So which, which meant a lot of um, uh, gaps in communication, rail strikes, postal strikes, uh, no connection with my family, friends, or anybody like that. That, that was a uphill task. I have written about that separately yep. those, those years. And uh, then I, I was always uh, sort of very restless to uh, leave uh, Lucknow. Uh, I didn't know the language. Hindi was uh, nowhere <laughs> in my um, uh, list of languages that I felt comfortable with. And so the, as soon as I got a chance at Jadukpur University, which was also at that time a special assistance department, I joined that place. And, uh, Fortunately for me, throughout my career, I have been able to serve in Jadapur, which remained a special assistance department okay. as long as I have taught there, and it, is, it still is. Okay. So in that way, philosophy is a very, very strong subject uh, at Jadapur University. Yeah. It's not marginalized. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about gender gap, one of the reasons often leading to a gender gap is the department itself is very weak. And the few jobs that are there, there's a scramble among men to get those jobs and women are sort of uh, elbowed out and they, they don't uh, get a chance. But when I joined the department, there were a fairly good number, like nine, 10 uh, uh, colleagues of mine, they were already women, they were serving there at the department. Okay. So uh, that was there, number one. Number two is that philosophy is a very, very popular subject in West Bengal. It was, it still is. 
every almost every undergraduate college has a philosophy department. So uh, graduating from any of the universities in within West Bengal, uh, there's a fairly good chance that if you have a good uh, CV, good uh, good uh, results, then you will be absorbed in some uh, undergraduate college or the other. In the department itself, we had uh, at the MA, it is a, uh, it teaches both BA and MA. <clears throat> at the MA level, they had 60, uh, 60 seats. Of the 60 seats, almost on an average every year, there were about 50 girl students and 10 boys. Mm -hmm. So the ratio was also tilted towards women at that, at that time. We can discuss later what could have been the reason or something like that, but that was the demography of the place, if you're talking about gender budgeting. Yeah. And uh, over the years, they have been consistently employing women. And now it is a women predominant, predominant uh, department. And men are in the minority at Jadhapur University. And they continue to enjoy the Center for Advanced Study status. So I would like to mention this, that people think that if it goes into the hands of women, then it just goes, yeah. goes, goes to ruins. And that has not been the case at Jalapur University. They have excelled. It's, it's nice to know about, about this particular kind of exception that Jadapur University has been uh, as far as uh, the, the general nature of the discipline of philosophy is concerned. But before we move ahead, I, I was just uh, triggered by uh, this uh, principal of the college, Romadi. Was she from philosophy? Yes, yes. She's a Vedanta specialist, though she did her PhD from London, uh, from England. And uh, she was married to a very famous Sanskrit uh, scholar, Yotindra Bimal uh, Choudhury. She was Rama Choudhury. And uh, she was from, from philosophy, but so well rooted in Sanskrit that they had um, a group, uh, that uh, drama, drama group, and they used to perform Sanskrit dramas in the college and in West Bengal and outside West Bengal as well. So she was interested in literature as well as in philosophy. Okay, so we, we should be thankful to Romadi for uh, getting Professor uh, Shefali Mitra to philosophy. I just you know, roped, him, roped him from, from the, what you call Gari Baranga, that is where the cars are parked. Yes, because that is, that is what made that uh, accidental shift. So, uh, like, uh, if we uh, just uh, distance ourselves from this uh, uh, pro-woman atmosphere that we have at Jadavpur University and move to the discipline of philosophy as, as it is, how has your journey as a woman philosopher or as a woman professor of philosophy been, been as far as teaching and doing philosophy is concerned, not at Jadavpur University, but in general? May I add something just before that? Because you yeah, gave, yeah. Me, uh, gave me the liberty in your letters that I could add a question if yeah, I like. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that is that, that there was a sort of, as I said, that among the students and among the uh, faculty, there was a kind of gender, not equality, but a semblance of balance. Balance. It was imbalance, but it, still you could sort of, it, you didn't topple over. But at the same time, I would like to uh, address the question that whether it was patriarchal or not. Mm -hmm. I'd, like to, um, I'd like to discuss that. And I was thinking over this question and I was thinking that it was not overtly patriarchal, but it was what I we call um, a paternal, Petern paternalistic. Mm -hmm. uh, that they were sort of always, the men were always sort of our chaperones, our guardians, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, our well-wishers and things like that. The day I joined the department, I was quite, because before that I was at Lucknow University where we were 90% of women yeah. in the faculty. It was a very small department, six people, were there, but most of them were women. And uh, we had to do a lot of administrative work on our own, but I was surprised to enter the, this department and find in one room, a male uh, uh, colleagues sitting there, uh, two uh, women sitting on the other side of the table and almost like pestering him that please write this application. You are also applying. So please draft the application and we will just copy it. I was really, really surprised that why should I 
uh, submit to this kind of uh, well, subjugation that somebody else is going to write uh, and I, I'm, I'm just going to copy it. But this was rampant. This was very common over there that uh, you go ahead and fill up the income tax form and then I'll just copy it. You go ahead and you do the uh, necessary uh, things for uh, leave application or, or the provident fund or whatever was necessary and we will just follow suit. But this was very common, number one. Number two, there was also, I would say, what we call hidden agenda. And the hidden agenda was so uh, subtle, so sophisticated. Uh, this we had worked with in uh, women's studies. You might be knowing <clears throat> that when Armaiti Deshaizi was um, the head of the UGC, that she had tried very hard to bring a kind of uh, gender balance within her uh, academics. Mm -hmm. And uh, she had arranged many uh, workshops which she called a uh, labeled capacity building workshops which i was also very closely related with and uh, conduct many uh, workshops were conducted like in bangalore in delhi and in other places in calcutta university where i had been and one of the things that were discussed over there and it's there in the kind of literature that they have prepared that why do women face a glass ceiling mm -hmm. that they are uh, they come in but they don't seem to move on to uh, becoming the dean, yep. uh, controller of examination, registrar, and things like that. Anyway, unfortunately, as of today, 2021, uh, Jadupur can boast of having, uh, just now they have a woman registrar, though it is an engineering uh, technology university, but they have a woman registrar. And uh, arts faculty has a woman as the dean of uh, faculty of arts. So these, it's, some kind of what I would call token representation is there. It is, they started moving a bit, a uh, bit only. But I'd say, I would say token representation in this sense that they are playing the institutional male game efficiently yeah, okay. like so any it, other. It is just biological representation. Nothing, nothing <laughs> that's, that's, just that. that's just there. Yeah, yeah, that's there. Uh, and the hidden agenda that I was talking about, the hidden agenda was pretty appalling. Uh, there was a time when as you know that we all all our departments have board of studies uh, which is a very uh, important uh, uh, body that and that yeah. looks after the administration of every department so that before the board of studies uh, meeting naturally we receive an agenda and that agenda is thoroughly discussed in our absence in some male members office or home or somewhere else that's the hidden agenda that's the way they arrange things before they come to the meeting so there is already a political underhand understanding among them that this is going to be the opposition and this is what we will have to pull through okay uh, this was discussed in capacity building that men are uh, sort of they can go out for a drink to some club or they go out to play golf or they go to play tennis and, and then they go to, to a 10 to 5 job and after that they don't have any opportunity to meet with other women or even with men you know to, to be yeah, yeah. Uh, quotes with uh, men and get uh, wrangle some power out of that they're not there so when they used to come to the department after some time we would say see the things are falling in place pretty much in the type of thing that we are opposing and how is it happening every time and how is it so predictable that when this person speaks that from across the room the other person is going to speak in unison we're going to say the same thing so that was there and the, another thing was which, which i was referring to as appalling was that the resolutions were drafted before the meeting started okay in a rough form and then the, after a bit of the discussion and you know pseudo democracy are uh, uh, sort of shuttling the ball across the room back and forth for a few couple of times. Now, okay, now let's come to the conclusion. And now let's um, have a resolution and could we uh, uh, word it in this way? And then something comes out of the person's pocket, a scribble sort of something, and that's read out. And then that is a fair copy is made. So these are the kind of things that okay, I man, yeah. Uh, yeah. collectively stood against. Okay. and opposed and saw to it that this minutes writing and minutes formulation, this has to be by rotation. Okay. It cannot be in one person's hand, meeting after meeting. But for this, you have to be very politically astute yeah. to understand how the game is going on. And fortunately, I don't know why. I personally feel this, and this is a sort of self-assessment. People also say this about me, 
it that somehow I have a political sixth sense. I can mm-hmm. understand how power broker, brokering is going on, going on. and uh, what, what's going on, the, the little, little chits of paper that are being passed under the table, somehow I can understand that. So that naturally also causes enemies. Okay. I won't say among men only, and among men, women, yeah. among women. And this is where that, uh, what you're talking about, biologically they are there. Yeah, yeah. Biologically, having a lot of women in the department doesn't make it a feminist department. Feminist department. Not at all. Make it a gender neutral. On the contrary, as we know, we talk about Sasbi Kavi Bahuti, that they are threatened by a woman who is not feminine, who is feminist. Okay. Okay. I was not feminist by uh, choice in the sense that I didn't know anything about feminism. I hadn't read anything about feminism, but it was just my. upbringing, my exposure, or whatever it was, that I was never silenced. So mm-hmm. I, I, I was a sort of a bohem, bohemian, rustic, wild type of person that I, I just never felt scared, never felt threatened. Yeah, oh, at the most, I'll just resign. I'll leave. I won't work. I'll go away. Okay. But how dare you step on my toes? I don't. I will not stand for this. And that helped my women friends to gradually, gradually gain courage from uh, copying resolutions to independently applying for Fulbright, Fulbright fellowships, being selected and going off, leaving their families, making some kind of arrangement, going off and getting further degrees, exposure and things like that. But it was not easy. Yeah. Simple thing. I, with another colleague of mine, she was a widow. I'm quote unquote a spinster. With a third friend, we wanted to go to a place in Bihar pretty pretty scenic place just for a weekend and the third person was a married person and there was such a lot of hush hush fish fish in the department that this Shifali she has come from I don't know where because I didn't belong to the Calcutta group I was from Shantini Ketan and Shantini Ketan is a marginalized place for Mm -hmm. the Calcutta people who are schooled in college and bred and brought up in Calcutta and uh, know the intellectual community right across from drama to media, to media, to film, to everybody. They're all uh, cha-cha and mama and somehow related to them. I'm I'm nowhere. So it's just a rootless person has come over. She's come to the department and she is going to see to it that these happily married women's families will be disrupted. (laughs) If they want to go out, they'll go out with their husband. They'll go out with their family. What is this? Three women traipsing away to some place, unknown place in Bihar for two nights, staying away from the family. This is not done. This is not right. Okay. So there was a lot of censor for that as well. So this is what I will be referring to as the hidden uh, agenda or the hidden kind of, uh, uh, we, we, we call it throat, the, the uh, flow of the river that flows be, uh, like uh, below, below the uh, surface. I'll give a last example. I, as I said, Bohemian. It was quite uh, at that time customary for my male colleagues between classes to just walk across the road and there was a dhaba over there. You know what these dhabas are like? Chai ka dhaba. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Extremely male centered places. Biscuits are available, a cigarette or some, something like that. So uh, I used to go with them and sit and have t- uh, tea in a kullat and uh, chat for quite some time. And then one for the, uh, whenever one, someone had a class, they would just cross the road and go back and we would continue. So our head of the department who was very uh, fatherly and uh, very approachable otherwise and very caring, uh, he didn't uh, address me directly, but he sent sort of a message through, through, through someone to me saying that I saw Shefali, she's sitting there sipping tea in that dhaba. This is not right. I can understand that between classes, she needs some kind of refreshment. I live on campus. Please, please tell her that our doors are always open for her. And Bhabi will be more than happy to prepare a cup of tea anytime in the afternoon if she wants it. So this is the kind of change of scenario that you have to work for within the academic space where people are very polite and uh, very polished. Mm-hmm. and uh, very 
theoretically, politically correct. Yeah. But for every in at every step, they are making faux pas about gender. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. I was uh, I represented the arts faculty, the single representation from the arts faculty to what we call the court. Mm -hmm. court or syndicate you can call, call that that's the highest body that makes all the governing uh, decisions for the entire university mm -hmm. so i'm always going to be punished over there some uh, employee and their party members stood up to in his support to so he had done something wrong and he had to be punished but to you know sort of uh, tone down the punishment and the argument was that uh, he has done something wrong doubtless, but his family has not done something wrong. So they should not suffer. Because After all, he has an unmarried daughter and an un unemployed son. I jumped up, sprung up absolutely. And this was such a sort of reflex action. And I addressed the vice chancellor at the house saying that, uh, I beg your pardon, this gentleman is misleading the house. The person he's talking about has an unmarried son and an unemployed daughter. Pin drop silence. But I think the penny drops. Some, some change takes place. Something happens after that. Mm -hmm. Changes do take place. No, without being aggressive. Yeah. So, uh, like... Go back to your question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> important uh, to understand, as you rightly said, that mere presence of women in any department or in any area doesn't want to make it gender uh, neutral or it does not make it uh, uh, like something which can embrace gender justice there is more to it and um, i have been i have been uh, personally directly coerced bullied harassed by a woman boss okay so in, like, in like, the patriarchal style, absolutely. I, I remember once uh, I was I was reading uh, Sharmila Raghay's article uh, uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Indian feminism, and she she she, she uh, uh, at one point of time argues in that article that women are given power, but only when uh, they are able to subjugate other women through that power. Like uh, <laughs> otherwise, there is no power given to women. Meanwhile, if we if we move ahead and move to the theoretical part of uh, uh, this uh, gender gap or uh, the the uh, uh, anti-woman attitude of philosophy as a discipline, the claim as as uh, you will be knowing and I, I and I think you'll agree with that is that philosophy remains male dominated, not just as far as uh, the ratio of male to female teachers is concerned or male to female philosophers is concerned, but in its theory, in its in its uh, uh, like in its out outlook as a discipline, the uh, the way it uh, the way philosophy is done, like uh, how do you perceive this claim uh, while being a woman philosopher uh, from India, while being a philosopher from India? I think I think this uh, qu question meshes in with Reggie's uh, remark. Yeah. Uh, in India, male dominated more than male dominated. It's Eurocentric. Okay. It's not the Indian male who is writing books and we are studying them and the Indian woman is writing them and we are not studying them. Mm -hmm. How many uh, male uh, teachers who have been uh, seen, commonly seen in the yes, uh, national and international seminar arena, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> using and uh, exercising their vocal cords, how many of their publications are known, recognized, taught, given a space in our Indian academia. Very, very few, very few, I think. There was if, a lot if we, of- If we uh, compare uh, that to women, then, then, then it's a fair good chunk. Uh, if we bring, bring it down to uh, uh, the ratio between women philosophers and uh, uh, men philosophers, male philosophers in yeah. India, then they, they still have a fair chunk. Maybe uh, uh, that's not my uh, yeah. experience at Jadupur University. Mm -hmm. Yadavpur University uh, pride, yeah. prides itself for reading uh, canonical texts in the original. So yeah. you have to read Hume, Kant, etc. They are original texts, not secondary sources at all. No secondary sources allowed in the uh, yeah. syllabus. 
And the same thing happens with the Sanskritized section, that there's a dom domination of Sanskritized Indian philosophy, where any kind of fusion uh, Indian philosophy or secondary source, not knowing Sanskrit and doing Indian philosophy is not acceptable here in Bengal. It is not acceptable. Uh, having said that, I, I can understand what, what you're talking about. But at the same time, I think that's another thing that we have been uh, pushing for and to a slight extent have been uh, successful in doing. And that is bringing in feminist philosophy in the sense of feminist epistemology, feminist ethics, feminist um, understanding of literature in the literature departments. Every department has been able to introduce uh, a component relating to the gender perspective mm -hmm. into the, I'm talking about humanities, mm -hmm. into the humanities. And that I think primarily we should give uh, the credit to uh, Professor Joshua Dharabakshi, who was a pioneer in India, I would say, at, at the national level, fighting for uh, feminism in academia. Mm -hmm. There again, my experience is like going, to, uh, going into philosophy surreptitiously. The fact that feminist philosophy is very popular in Jadavpur now among the research students, and uh, that it is a full-fledged special paper uh, that is being taught in which feminist epistemology, hardcore theory, feminist logic, uh, as taught and research is also being done, but it all began in my office room for an MPhil special paper with two students mm -hmm. and nobody recognizing that the makings of a torpedo is going on over here. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when that quite a few batches uh, graduated and they did their MPhil and PhD in feminism, then they realized that this is a force to be reckoned with and we should have nipped it in the bud but we did not realize that this is what's going to happen. We thought it, it, it's an innocent kind of let them play around, margin on the margins, let them go around. But now it's come to such a uh, place that uh, Calcutta University does not ent uh, entertain any kind of uh, gender perspective. It, it's a very much mainstream, mainstream course. And I think they'll fit in very well with the kind of thing that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And all these undergraduate colleges, most of them, 80% of them are under the ages of Calcutta University. Jadavpur does not have any affiliation. So we produce the teachers, but we can't employ them. They have to be employed elsewhere. And when the third candidate came in for the College Service Commission, who happened to be all three in uh, successive row, happened to be my PhD scholars in feminism. When the third person came in, uh, they asked, naturally asked her, uh, what is your specialization? What have you worked on? Mm. Who have you worked uh, under whose su supervision? And they looked at each other and they said, Abar Shefali. Again, and this is the Pied Piper who's corrupting all the people right across wherever she goes, she creates trouble. So this, but now there is a kind of stampede for doing PhD under those students who I have trained and left back in the department. Mm. It's, it's very popular over there to work on uh, something related to offbeat kind of subjects, applied applied kind of subjects. So it's very slow. We have been able to introduce in uh, Calcutta University in all the undergraduate colleges in the philosophy department, uh, feminist philosophy feminist philosophy, a paper on feminist ethics or general uh, introduction to uh, gender and sexuality, whatever the university has chosen, but it is there in every every, every philosophy department. Okay, I, I'll just, I'll just uh, like uh, uh, enlarge this question a bit because this is really important. And uh, I, I uh, uh, like uh, really uh, respect uh, the way in which Jadavpur University, because I have gone through the syllabus, like has given space to feminist perspectives and gender perspectives in the syllabus and has, uh, I guess, the largest, uh, a large number of courses on uh, which are uh, uh, feminist in nature. Uh, so that is that is that's a step forward than uh, 
other universities or other institutions which still have a male centric uh, uh, syllabi or curriculum to offer. But at the same time, don't you think that uh, the system, the patriarchal system, takes it, rubs, rubs it over by just concentrating women's perspectives quote and with quote unquote feminism as if women sorry i couldn't hear that part like uh, yeah yeah, yeah. I, I just repeat it so isn't it when uh, when when we have institution when we have uh, certain certain departments giving space to gender perspectives to feminist perspectives in their syllabi so that um, uh, the women's voices can be heard but it's 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 it, it isn't it giving a leverage to the patriarchal system isn't there a risk that it gives a leverage to the patriarchal system or the hidden hand behind to just reduce women's voices to feminist voices just no. reducing women out to no, no. Feminist voices and just removing them altogether from other courses no. where women are doing well it's it's not just that women are just can do just because I, I, I can just see uh, it uh, a risk that things may turn over and uh, it may be like we have we have we, we have we respect uh, 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 gender equality. So we have four feminist courses and that's all. And these are women's courses that these be done by women, rest all is male supported. So the right. thing remains. So yeah. uh, and, and there's a sort of male backlash. Yeah, yeah. Kind of thing. But you know what happens at uh, I would like to refer to Sartre's counter finality. Okay. But you have a project. Yeah. And uh, you think that you're going to go in this direction. But yeah. something happens that okay. was unpredictable, uh, not really designed, it was not there in your design, and it topples whatever uh, calculation you had done. Mm -hmm. That is happening. Why is it happening? Now, if you go to the bookstores and you go to the book fairs, how many books do you get written by Oxbridge hardcore analytical philosophers? All of these books have been replaced now by interdisciplinary type of studies. Sociology and uh, philosophy, sociology, economics and philosophy, and the interesting work that is being done around the world, even if we talk about a, a very sort of a male uh, bastion like cognitive science, we have a, a a school of cognitive science, which is part of the philosophy department. We give the MA degrees given by the department. Even within cognitive science, they're talking about the third wave and the fourth wave, like we talk about that in yeah. uh, feminism. And their fourth wave is very much like the waves that we are going through in feminism in terms of breaking away from that too valued uh, classical a kind of approach to cognitive science naturally mm -hmm. because they have to map emotions mm -hmm. now they understand they have to map emotions they have to map an integrated uh, integrated picture of the brain you can't say that this is reason and this is emotion now when my male colleagues come across an article written by somebody who's quite uh, famous for that particular article and they just can't make head of head of tail of what's going on because they don't have that wherewithal that gives you the insight of looking at <clears throat> power being implicated into implicated into a discipline. Foucault is also an outsider, like feminism is an outsider in the male bastion of philosophy. When you're doing Nay, Veshishika, Vedanto, and things like that, they are not willing to uh, listen to you that it is contextualized or that there is a power agenda mm -hmm. that is um, sort of. Um, Knit, knit into the formal part. It's not an add-on. It's a constitutive part. They are not accustomed to that. They're not trained for that. And they are quite uh, on a back foot because they are not trained for that. So what is happening is that these people that are trained in a, a cross between that they, they know uh, feminist epistemology, they know their Foucault, they know their Derrida, they know a little bit of sociology. They have attended various workshops and things like that. They're very much in demand in refresher courses and places where people want to really, you know, <laughs> renew their original stock of knowledge. So a time has come, I think, around the world where barriers are breaking in other universities and departments outside India. I'm not talking about India, outside India. We have not caught on to that as yet. 
but we can hear the rumblings. And I feel very optimistic okay. that our expertise is going to be is sought after and it is going to be further sought after. Uh, widely as far as different uh, philosophical schools. Different, uh, philosophy, so, especially feminist philosophy is something that all our colleagues in other departments, arts faculty departments, they want to know. Okay. So uh, one of the ways in which uh, gender gap, this multi-layered as, as this conversation is uh, 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 like uh, pro uh, progressing, so it's it's um, uh, kind of unraveling that gender gap in itself is a multi-layered problem. It's not as easy as as it looks, um, and is to uh, uh, like uh, bring to fore or uh, so to say uh, uh, make people aware about the works done by women philosophers, which uh, uh, till then uh, people may not know about or we may not be aware about and i think yes, uh, i have remembered a point i'd like to add before i go to that yeah uh, and that is that the male uh, response to this kind of inroads made by uh, feminism so my colleague uh, who is a woman a very good friend of mine she reminds me shivali do you remember the first seminar where you first spoke about gender as a category of interpretation i said no what happened you don't remember, it was a national seminar organized by the department and you were reading a paper. And then she named all the uh, stalwarts of the department, male, uh, those who were writing the resolution before coming to the meeting. Mm -hmm. They were all present. I said, yes, then what happened? She said that you completed your paper, there's pin drop silence. Okay. Any questions? Pin drop silence. So then is the session over? pin drop silence. So this silencing somebody, killing somebody by ignoring them totally. Yeah, what is she talking about? Not even worth discussing, not even worth asking a single question. Okay. Similar type of person in Calcutta University with the same kind of aggressive, boorish kind of approach to any uh, mention of gender or things like that. I met a student, I said, who are you working with? And who supervision? The same person. What are you working on? Feminism and Buddhism. What? So this doing your homework <laughs> behind, behind the audience and giving a sort of male <laughs> a natural look in front. This is also going on. Yeah, uh, that's that's part and parcel of the game. Uh, part and parcel of the game because because as you know that liberalism when it changes into neoliberalism has to know where the attacks are coming from what its vulnerability is and how it can uh, grow in its uh, resistance and resilience to the attack from the other okay yeah please so uh, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll move to your work as a woman philosopher now um, uh, so you have worked on Wittgenstein and you have studied Wittgenstein under a feminist lens and dealt with the proper Wittgenstein debate, uh, famously known as the poker incident that you just uh, talked about uh, yesterday while we were exchanging mails. Can you enlighten us uh, and uh, as well as the viewers about your work on Wittgenstein? My work on Wittgenstein, uh, partly by accident because uh, again, uh, there is an allotment committee in our department. And for years and years and years, the allotment was done by a caucus. And so we had to teach whatever we were allotted. Though we did give in our preferences, um, many of them were never you know, honored. Okay. So uh, I was allotted Wittgenstein and I had to study Wittgenstein. And of course, fortunately, since I was in the center of advanced study at Shantini Kitan, and uh, there at the MA level, we had a special paper on logical positivism that's back in 1967, which was quite unusual in the Indian universities because by that time, uh, a commentary on the Tractatus other than Kopi's commentary, there is not, very much was not written or available at that time. KJ Shah was doing a lot of good work in uh, Dharwad, but in most universities, uh, the Tractatus was not taught, but we were taught the entire text line by line. So that facilitated my uh, sort of confidence that I'll be able to take this up uh, at Jadapur. 
then while working in uh, Jadapur, I didn't initially use the feminist lens for that. But later when I got, got into feminism, which was again after a lot of resistance and uh, coaxing by uh, Joshua Dharadi, who was my teacher at Lady Brebon College uh, under Rama Chaudhuri, uh, she tried very hard that I should be publishing something on uh, gender studies. And I said that, no, I don't want <clears throat> to publish something on gender because that is going to weaken my CV. CV, I'll be uh, seen as a soft philosopher that I, I, I will not be able to compete with my other colleagues. So it took me some time to decide and uh, begin writing. And then the preface to my feminist thought, I have mentioned her name. And I have remarked that feminist philosophy is a subject that you cannot walk in and walk out of. Once you walk in, you stay there. There's no way that you, you know, casually just uh, try your hand on it and then, then get out of it. So once I got uh, into, uh, got interested into uh, feminism, then I was thinking that I, I, what I'm looking at in feminism are different political groups, the liberals, uh, the radicals, the uh, different, different kinds of uh, politics that they're doing, the Marxist feminist. And I could find, uh, it seemed, seemed to me, that there were these two groups. One group is talking about inclusion, and the other group is talking about restructuring. Mm -hmm. So the group that is talking about inclusion, they are looking at the uh, gender biases and discrimination as errors of omission, they are fault lines, they need to be repaired. And once the house is repaired, then the master's house is quite a comfortable place to stay. And that's the only uh, available source of power. So if you want to be powerful, then you will have to enter that house, of course, in your terms. Mm -hmm. And that clicked. And I thought that, well, that's what the tractators could provide. Okay. That there is no empirical metaphysical account of the world, but he's picturing the world. He's talking about representation, but he is not, he's talking in uh, philosophical logical terms, logical terms. Okay. So I thought that this, this is the kind of thing that we should look for if we want to sanitize the place of all gender and things like that. So that brought me clicked. And I thought that, well, this, is, this could be a feminist reading, but this could be a feminist reading from the liberal feminist, the radical feminists would not be comfortable with uh, breaking the master's house with the master's tools. Okay. So then I, after quite a couple of years, they introduced the PI at the MA level. Previously, it was not there. In the new syllabus, the PI came, and I was given the responsibility of teaching philosophical investigations. Mm -hmm. And then looking at philosophical investigations, I thought that this person is a person who is at the cusp just before the Second World War. And it seems that uh, a lot of what he has said almost simultaneously is being said by Quine. And because Wittgenstein's PI has not been uh, translated and is not well known at that time, things were already in place. And Wittgenstein in no way is, uh, was gender friendly or a feminist or anything like that. But never mind, as a feminist, I am shopping around for tools and I'm going to use those tools harmonically or whatever you say in my, uh, for, on my own terms in my own way. Mm -hmm. This is something that my guide, Kalida Shuhattachadjo, uh, used to uh, lay great emphasis on. Uh, he was a very friendly, uh, chatty type of person. And so he used to say, Shivali, when you're doing your PhD, you, you should look around like a crow. crow. You know, when a crow builds a nest, it's a very clumsy, ugly kind of nest. Why? Because the crow is not judgmental about what are the building materials for the nest. Anything that can be stuck together can go into a crow's nest. So, but before that, you'll notice that what does a crow do? The crow sits on a piece of, uh, on a limb or a piece of rag or, or a piece of iron wire or something like that and tugs at it mm -hmm. just to see its strength. Is it strong enough to buttress my uh, nest? If it is, okay, take it. So that was my, uh, that is my approach. 
to canonical uh, studies, to, to mainstream philosophers and things like that. That's why you find in many places I'm talking about feminist reading, feminist reading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, feminist reading is Please, reading that, that, that. Uh, them from a gender lens. So when I look at uh, Wittgenstein, and I'm not the only person, many feminists have done this. They have found him very resourceful uh, in terms of breaking the analytical philosophy uh, stronghold. And I think that in a great way, postmodernism has also been informed by data Wittgenstein, whether they recognize it or not. Postmodernism, post-structuralism, though I am pretty aware of the reading of Wittgenstein where they look at a continuity thesis, that there is no real later Wittgenstein and early Wittgenstein. Many of the things that have said in a very cryptic way in early Wittgenstein have been elaborated in later Wittgenstein and it is a continuum. But I don't go by that, that thesis. I do think that there was a break to share the gap. And later Wittgenstein as is a very different thesis. Okay. So uh, this is about Wittgenstein and your reading. Uh, uh, unfortunately, we don't have time. Otherwise, we would have gone into the poker incident. But we have, we have some, some, some more things to cover. So I'll go to your main, uh, main expertise, like the lens which you have used in doing philosophy, that's feminist philosophy. And it has remained your focus. You have worked on Simone de Beauvoir's philosophy. You have had, as you just mentioned, feminist readings of Tagore. That's the philosophy of literature that you have done. Tagore, you have done a feminist reading of uh, Freudian psychoanalysis. You have also uh, done a feminist uh, reading of medical practice. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what essentially does a feminist reading unravel which otherwise, if there is no feminist reading, will remain unattended to or hidden? Okay. Difficult question. Yeah, difficult question, I'm almost out of syllabus. I, but I think that I will, you know, turn couple around and then maybe uh, find my centrifugal force after that. <laughs> uh, yes. The way power operates is uh, invisible to a non-feminist reading because we think that disciplines are to be seen through a neutered lens mm -hmm. objectively, try to understand what the author is saying, almost like a, a, re a reader should be taking a view from nowhere. Mm -hmm. I am quite aware of the fact that <laughs> the author is dead and I we interpret and things like that, but, the, but those positions, I would not call mainstream. For me, me mainstream is the positivistic, post-positivistic kind of approach, which is still there, especially in uh, the philosophy, of, in the mainstream philosophy of science kind of studies. Feminist philosophy of science, again, is, is very different. So I think that this lens that asks you to look at the look at the game of power, uh -huh. not only at the concrete level, which the activists are taking care of, not only at the institutional level, which is, is embedded in our uh, judiciary and um, legal system and education and all that, not at that, but there is a conceptual level. And that conceptual level, we are taught to look at as being abstract. Okay. There, I uh, think that if we use our feminist lens, we will be able to see things like reason is gendered, okay. which is a big chunk to swallow, very difficult to accept. Yeah. And there are feminists who will not buy this argument because they are talking about breaking the master's house with the master's tool. And the problem with reason being gendered is that uh, uh, unwanted, context and unwanted power games have come in, which have nothing to do with reason. Okay. So reason needs to be sanitized. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this was also, uh, I have previously mentioned Pranav Kumar Shen. This was also his stand. He, he used to say that man is a rational animal. So this animality portion has to be subdued, suppressed, and rationality portion has to be okay. uh, expressed. And then we will be able to gain gender equality. I don't see how anything can be enhanced or suppressed without a context. And I very much do uh, believe in the genealogy of meaning and that meaning is an area of contestation and that there 
women have a hard time because they're not given what they call technically called semantic authority. They don't have that semantic authority. So when we're looking at something from a gendered lens, then it will, uh, what is, could be expected is like what happened during my first seminar, that we don't have the semantic authority. So either we are not understood or we are understood, but we are relegated to a ghetto. As you said, that men are doing men's work and you go ahead with your uh, feminist philosophy. Okay, we have to post for that. No, I want to bring in feminist philosophy again as uh, repeatedly anybody who does feminism knows that i'm not talking about biological women being given seats but i'm talking about a change perspective in which men will have a better deal than they have in patriarchy as well as women will have a better deal so i would like to look at the concepts and um, also uh, evaluate them from a gender angle from a from a power, power angle and try to find out how certain things have, uh, have been inbuilt uh, into the exclusions, exclusion of emotion, as you are repeatedly talking about literature and philosophy of literature. When I talk, work on Tagore or I work on his dance drama, right, I'm not reading a piece of literature. Okay. I'm reading the life of the protagonist and her relationship to her lover. And I'm looking at the entire thing from the institution of uh, the, the domestic institution, the state, the way uh, these institutions are in place and how Tagore at that time was, uh, sounded very radical, but from our understanding of feminism today on, on some accounts or many, many accounts, I have picked up a debate with Tagore saying, that how can you say uh, about Chitrangada and everybody is saying it and they're so sort of gaga about Tagore's Chitrangada that Tagore in his time said that Chitrangada is telling Urjuna that you will not recognize me. You, don't, you will never know who I am unless and until you learn to respect the left hand and allow the left hand to collaborate with the right hand. Okay. Why? The right hand is a patriarchal hand. Why should I want to uh, collaborate with that right hand? That's what I'm fighting against. So for me, equality does not mean mujhe bhi le chalo, take me along. Okay. Yeah. That, that's but this kind of question, I don't think this is, has got anything specifically to do with literature. This is a question that any oppressed person will talk about. That. Uh, what are the values? And then she says that I'm carrying a child. I'm carrying your child. If this child is a male child, I'll bring him, bring him up in your image. And when he's an adult, I'll take him to you. But I, who are you whose image I have to follow in your absence, like carrying uh, Sri Ramchandra's uh, <laughs> karam to, to the uh, throne as long as he is absent? And then what happens if it is a girl? You look after the girl child. Okay. I can even disown that I have fathered that girl child. So what happens over there? So these are the kind of questions that I think that the feminist lens brings in and it brings in into epistemology also. Where is the body? Where is emotion? Where is woman's lived experience? Or any, for, for that matter, man's lived experience. When you're talking about medicine, med medical practice, where is the research on postmenopausal health? Everybody is inter uh, interested in reproduction, <laughs> reproductive health. But the problems that women are facing, like osteoporosis and, um, uh, and great amount of depression and things like that in their old age, where is the research on that? So the state sees the woman as a reproductive machine and the medical system is, the, the, they'll say the little money that we have, we have to spend over here. Mm -hmm. And we are not interested in the missing women. And the missing women are not only the missing women that Amukta Shen is talking about at the time of birth. Mm -hmm. They're missing later also. Yeah. So this I, is the I kind of thing. I remember that Amartya Sen article, more than uh, 10 million women are missing. It's an interesting <laughs> So uh, uh, moving, moving on, it's, it's, it has been very interesting to talk to you. 
Uh, can you can you just tell us because our focus is on women philosophers? Can you just tell us uh, the names of few women philosophers who have inspired you or influenced your career as a woman philosopher? Oh, um, don't don't, don't you think this will be very mean to have a short list? No, you can give any. You are huge. When, when you're talking about sisterhood is powerful, and you're talking about margins are important, and you're talking about collaboration participatory democracy, uh, then to give a list of 10 or 100. I uh, mean, every moment you are learning, you're learning from uh, your uh, students in a gender study class, they're both women and men. In, uh, fortunately, right from the inception of uh, School of Women's Studies at Jadhpur University, our male colleagues have taken part in the teaching and learning process, and they've taken part in uh, uh, setting up the syllabus. They have also taken part in administration. They uh, from the engineering faculty and as well as from the science faculty. They haven't come in hordes, and that will be uh, untrue, but they have been there. It has not been an exclusionary kind of situation. So I think I have learned uh, both from uh, my uh, female friends, associates, and of course, by reading people like Simone de Boboa, Gilly Gunn, or uh, even Val Pramod, who's uh, talking about the male voice in a reason. Uh, Helen Longino, who uh, is in Stanford, a very close friend, works on the philosophy of science, feminist uh, philosophy of science. So, uh, and, and there's so many, so many, many people uh, that perhaps didn't think that they're talking in a feminist voice, but they are talking in a feminist voice and you read their poetry or you read their piece and you learn from them. For instance, I've learned so much from uh, my colleague and friend Amita Chatterjee. Okay. She is not a feminist. She doesn't claim to be a feminist. But her book in 1994 on vagueness mm -hmm. was really and still is uh, sort of awe inspiring to me because that is when uh, feminism started moving towards pluralism, towards uh, identity politics, moving away from the uh, closures and centrism of philosophy of science kind of thing. So to talk about vagueness in the context of logic, to talk to, she has um, formulated a logic of vagueness, which is, was something really path breaking at that time. And that, as I said, like a crow, I'm looking around for that tool. I'm desperately in a search of a logic of vagueness because I'm talking about gendered reason and people are telling me at a seminar that Shefali knows where she wants to go and she, the way she wants to go, every step she's playing foul. She's not following any of the rules. So she goes zigzag, crisscross, however she wants. Just she wants to go and fall at the reach. end. I fall don't... at the end. But yes, apparently it looks like that from a very regimented perspective yeah, yeah, from of human philosophy. That's not my sense of yeah. So uh, you, uh, are an Indian-based woman philosopher, and you have done a lot of work. So how do you think that women philosophers like you have shaped or can shape the evolution and progress of philosophy in India, be it in any form? It's an uphill task, and I think <clears throat> something that has been put in place over 2,000 years uh, to predict something that how is it going to be done uh, within the next uh, 10, 20 years, or even with this, within this millennium uh, is, uh, is uh, I think a typically, um, what, what should I say, the type of a question that a development um, donor, uh, funds, funds donor would like to put across that, how is your project going to help the poor woman? Yeah. How is it going to help the Dalit woman? Mm -hmm. Is uh, Dalit oppression going to end at the end of this uh, two crore pro project? Uh, and then I have to explain, yes, sir, this is how it's going to do and uh, going to be done. And then again, as you know, I have to use a kind of quantitative mm -hmm. uh, research methodology to please those fun funders. Yeah. So uh, any kind of ethnography, any kind of qualitative research, any, any kind of narrative approach, will not do. And similarly to this question that how is it going to help and how do you think 
it's not going to come only from academics. It's not going to come yeah. from within philosophy. That, that, that's what I wanted to hear. Yeah, it is going to be a, a mindset, a change in the mindset. Yeah. And my students are, I hope, I hope in many cases they are, they are going into stereotypical um, matchmaking and things like that. And then they can see through it and they're not happy. And you'll say that, are you happy that they're not happy? Are you happy that they're breaking away? No. I'm not that part. I'm not. Nobody's happy about anybody's unhappiness, but this is a kind of unhappiness that is empowering. So when I wrote about pain, this is something that I wrote about. That there are some pains that help you grow. Number one. Number two. There are some pains that should not be forgotten. Mm -hmm. They should be remembered as a part of the movement. Mm -hmm. So after uh, going through a, a, a gruesome rape experience, to say. Oh, Forget about it. Think of it as a bad nightmare. Why should I forget about it? Why should I forgive and forget? That doesn't mean that I'm asking for capital punishment. No, not that. But they, the movement should go on on this agenda and we should not forget about it. The focus should be there. The focus should be to better things rather than uh, any like... In a holistic way, manner. In any, a holistic any, manner. In a holistic manner. For I don't blame agency. Mm -hmm. Rather than it being like any other neoliberal project, <laughs> you have a focus. But I think we must jump at our opportunities. Jump at yeah, our opportunities. Yeah. The fact that today uh, uh, feminism is taught at every undergraduate college partly was due to one of my friends who included a book written by Shifali Moitro named Noitikata Naribad. I had no book by that name at that time. I had an article. Okay. And the course was to begin six months forward. I thought this is an opportunity. I better write a full book. Since they have included this in the syllabus, I shouldn't write to them saying that you expunge that and there's no book like that and it's not available in the market and things like that. I should write the book and make it available in the market. And that is now like Bhagavad Gita for those who are doing uh, feminism in uh, vernacular feminism. I want to do a second edition. They're saying, no, 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 no. There's a lot of difficulty. <laughs> we have memorized this and we have prepared questions for this. This is a sort of an Medizi and tutorial homes and all of this has grown around it, a whole industry. So please don't replace this book. Uh, keep it as it is. So you have to jump at these opportunities. So uh, thank you very much for thank being with us see. and uh, for, for uh, giving us this opportunity to have this conversation with you. It has been really fruitful, uh, and I, I hope that the reverse, when it goes uh, online and when it's uploaded on our website, our reverse and even us, uh, all of us as a team, will learn a lot of things from, uh, from it. So thank you very much for accepting our invite.